Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. It is a noon hour on Thursday, folks. Ted Rawson here in our Honolulu studios, Think Tech Studios, uh, downtown Honolulu, with a fantastic show on our Where the Drone Leads uh, periodic episode. This one is uh, all about shared airspace, sharing airspace between drones and manned helicopters. And uh, helping us figure that problem out, we have, uh, first of all, online from the island of Lanai, we have George Purdy, uh, who is uh, Mr. UAS Aviation on the island of Lanai. George, uh, welcome aboard again. Thank you. Thank you for having me on the show. All right, George. Glad to be here. Cool. And we're glad you're here. And we have on this side in the studio, we have Mr. Scott Allen. Scott, thanks for coming on. First time around the show. Always a pleasure. Scott is uh, part of either the Future Farmers of America or the FAA. I've forgotten which. Is it's it? FAA safety FAA. team. FAA uh, safety team. Safety team, okay, which is part of the FISDO, I presume? Indeed. Uh, I'm attached to the FISDO. Attached yes. to the FISDO. Right on. Okay, here in Honolulu. And Eric Lincoln, who is the Director of Operations at Blue Hawaiian Helicopters, uh, right. taking care of the tourists who come to town here and yes. emergency operations and such as well. Mm -hmm. So we have a fantastic uh, gathering, uh, two complete opposite bookends of the whole airspace issue, especially the low altitude airspace. So uh, I, I wanted to just start by, by pointing out, um, this is a show about drones, so we have to say the word drone. We've said that, that's enough. And then we have to have a drone item here on the table. So we have it with us, uh, something for you guys to take a look at. This is uh, kind of the, the entry level uh, military type drone used by Spec Ops and such. This is missing its battery and missing a payload. This thing weighs about two pounds, battery weighs another pound and a half, and it carries four pounds of payload. And that's its ground station over here. And I would say that most drones we're speaking of uh, that would be in the airspace we're thinking about where we have common interests would be in the same size and weight scale. So I just put that out here for <clears throat> physical awareness. This is a ground control station that would be used to operate this thing in flight sea. A drone is always two things. It's a ground station, radio communication, and the air component. So that's what's going on here. Quite different from manned aviation where it's the guy in the cockpit. Anyway, uh, I wanted to introduce this subject of uh, uh, airspace sharing. We, you know, we have a, my experience anyway, we have a uh, increasing population using drones, and they come from basically not from the aviation side of the house. So they're not familiar with a lot of things, and you take a drone out of the box, and there may be some instructions you can't understand, and you think, well, this, since I can't understand it, it probably doesn't apply to me, so I'll go use my drone any way I want. We have that bunch. Then we have the folks like George on the other side and the professionals we work with, which are very attentive to rules and such, and you probably have people in between. There's all kinds of folks using these things, and they're all using them, and, and generally they're respecting 400 feet and below because they typically have a software limit of 400 feet, but uh, not always. And so there are so many users, and there are so many means by which you can actually use a drone in the airspace today. There's educational, there's recreation, there's various forms of authorizations, and there's 107 now. And so uh, with that situation, we have a lot of competition, frankly, in the airspace in some regards. So I wanted just to start a long conversation here that won't ever have an end. It won't certainly solve it today. But if we can begin some kind of communication between the various users of the airspace and find a way to get at them and let them know what's going on, that would be great. So I. Let me turn first to Eric. You're the other side of this equation, <laughs> using the airspace uh, with uh, jet rangers and such. Yes, we've, we've got about 34 aircraft in 34. the water. Okay. And uh, just in our organization, there's uh, many more than that operating here. Uh, one of the conflicts that, that we've experienced is we're all looking at the same thing. You know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. The waterfall. So the focus the is the same, right. Yeah, okay. exactly. So it's got the waterfall, like, the beach, the whatever it might be that attracts people to Hawaii. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, everyone wants to take a picture. And everyone wants a different purview. And it's uh, we've had some uh, close encounters. We actually had one hit one of our aircraft. So it's uh, it's a very real to our people uh, that fly them and uh, to the people that are in them. So we're very invested in seeing how we can integrate safely. And uh, we understand that the, the professionalism for segments of the industry are, are huge, very professional, very well disciplined in how they do things. And uh, we admire that a lot because they're, they're valuable in disasters, they're valuable in rescues and agricultural work. There's just all kinds of avenues that we know they're gonna be ahead of the manned aircraft uh, very rapidly. It's more concerned us uh, that we see is going to be the 
amateurs, uh, the people from foreign countries who bring mm -hmm. these in and their carry-on baggage that uh, have no clue about what their U.S. airspace, how it's constructed, what regulations we may have. And uh, it, they're not, as you say, they take it out of the box and away they go. Um, it, that's that's a, what we see as one of the biggest problems. So we, that, that's sort of like a sort of a promotional and educational campaign of some kind that's going to be required to get that information out. So let's turn for a moment to Scott over there at uh, Honolulu Airport, uh, watching all the standards emerging and such. In fact, standards are emerging so fast in this business, and, and I don't know how you guys keep up with them. It's tough for us to keep up with them. I was going to say, a, a little while back you said the conversation will never end, and the, the technology is evolving at such a rate that there is always a new, uh, a new facet that's being developed. And one uh, point of information, um, you'd, you'd mentioned that a drone uh, operation, um, uh, what, we, what we tend to call small unmanned uh, aerial systems, is um, uh, the hardware and the operator on the ground, the ground station, and the FAA would, would add another element in that we define the links, the control, uh, command and control linkage as being a, a third element that, that makes up the system that operates the drones. So and I'm using drones generically here because it's we more do. complicated than manned aircraft already because you're obligated to have the man on the ground situation. It's just not a guy in a cockpit anymore. Yeah. So it, it is quadruply complicated already. And so quad once again, quadruply might be an understatement. <laughs> understatement. <laughs> Today it could be, but tomorrow it won't be. Yeah. Okay, and so uh, FAA is sitting in the middle of all this pot that's stirring, and we have the, the uh, uninformed users, we have the professional users, we have folks in between, we have the other folks using the airspace. So keeping up with all that and finding a way to pull up the salient information and get it out there has got to be a bit of a challenge. It, it is indeed. That's why and, you're on the show. No, right? that's, uh, <laughs> uh, the Drone Zone uh, is a great program that we have uh, online mm -hmm. that facilitates uh, transfer of information, uh, requesting waivers, any number of things. The Drone Zone, um, we have another program, uh, Lance, um, the president has directed a fast-track uh, pilot program for industry and uh, regulatory collaboration to uh, move ahead, move faster with getting drones integrated completely into the system. So there are a lot of initiatives like that. There is a program on the FAA website where you can call up a map uh, that will show the maximum altitudes that can be flown in, in any given sector. Um, that map is not an authorization to fly those altitudes, it just says what the maximum permissible uh, request could be. So we are working really hard to, to promulgate the information. And there's a whole other side of this that is not present in our conversation, and it's sort of represented by George to a certain extent, but that's the landowners and the, uh, the people who have uh, uh, issues with uh, privacy in, uh, invasion or in, in trespassing on land and such. So there's a bunch, of, there's a whole civil side to this that we don't have to worry about in the manned aviation domain so much. And we don't really have a website you can turn to, frankly, that says here's what the land ownership requirements are, here's what the, uh, what the, we have best practices, but you have to dig hard to find them. So we really have a situation where the, just for the average guy who either came from some foreign country or who bought a drone at Amazon or something, he has a, quite a challenge to figure out all the information he needs and figure out where his relevance is and what he has to do. So it's a, it's a daunting thing. Let's turn for a moment to uh, George Purdy, standing by on the island of Hawaii. And let me just offer this as a, before we uh, hear George talk. Uh, one of the recent FAA uh, uh, solicitations or innovations was something called UPP, it's the Unmanned Pilot Program, which is a follow-on to the IPP, and that is uh, requesting uh, manufacturers to figure out how to do the data block transfers from users to the FAA air traffic control centers to the dealing with the ADSB out and such in some data transmission form to support UAS operations. We uh, submitted on that along with the University of Alaska, and guess what? Out of all the 450 airports in the United States of America that the FAA picked to have one of the, the, one, the one airport scenario in the, that you have to bid on is the airport called LNY here on Lanai Island, Georgia's airport. 450, that's like less than a tenth, two tenths of a percent of all the airports. Something about that airport is magic in the eyes of the FAA. It's got, it's, it's uh, um, controlled airspace, ECHO. 
it's not operated that way. It's operated more like VFR. But it's, uh, so it has the need to be disciplined in controlled airspace, but it doesn't have the traffic that would present a problem for testing. So somebody inside the FAA figured that out and wrote that into the script. So anyway, we're very proud of that and proud of George. George, are you there? Yep, so okay. I'm here. So you heard the conversation so far. Tell us a little bit about what you've been doing on the island with regard to public safety, UAS use, and how you bridged all these gaps that we've just described. Sure. There we are. So, so about two years ago, I came across this um, FAA document called Community Involvement Manual. Came out February 2016. So as I started reading this manual, it gives you a step-by-step -step how to uh, uh, involve your community in whatever project that you wanted to do. So as I was uh, studying drones and what was happening on the continent and watching how the communities were really left out of the loop and my feelings and their feelings as they put it out there was that, you know, the government was just shoving drones down their throat. So I took that as an opportunity to start now educating my community first and have the community actually um, support me in drones in for search and search and rescues and emergency situations. So I got them involved in that sense of them taking ownership. And this manual has a lot of information that uh, it helps us as FAA operators or in the FAA airspace to actually find that local person. Like for me, I work at Lanai Airport. My day job is on my airport fireman, and I do a lot of emergency preparedness planning, triannual disaster drills. So it has taught me how to interact with my community. So I took just some of these skills, and when UAS came out uh, and came out of the woodworks, and I wanted to be a part of the UAS in Hawaii. I took the lead in educating my community, taking what FAA is sending down, regurgitating it, chewing it up, and making it digestible for my community. That's the way we got to look at it. We got to look at local airports taking the initiative and educating their community. We can't wait to, for these folks to actually read a memo from Washington, which they have no understanding what it is. We need to find those local key personnel, key personal Key personalities or businesses willing to step forward within their community and explain what is going on, taking pride in uh, uh, supporting schools, having an aviation day, a drone prevention month, just something that we can expose a lot of the issues that we are having today. That's, a, that's great, and, and uh, we got to take what George is doing on Lanai, which admittedly has a 3,100-person population and uh, not a lot of heavy air traffic, and transpose that over here to Oahu, where the numbers go up by a factor of 100, maybe, and uh, uh, figure out how to distill all this into, as he said, digestible information that the public can grab onto. We started at one school here, I think uh, Kapolei uh, Middle School, on, in, the, uh, in the approach of uh, uh, Kapolei Airport, and uh, Kalelo Airport, and we've had one interaction there. I think we could do like George said, start with the airports. And let's work in the airport community area. That's kind of where one area where interactions can occur and, and start generating get-togethers of some kind, information sharing, get-togethers, looking at each other face-to-face -face and figure this out. I mean, it, it's where it is today, it's gonna to be four times that in, in a couple of years. So the sooner we start, the better. I wonder if we can use the Aviation Caucus as a channel here. What, what do you think about that, Eric? I think that would work well, but the, the, the bottom line issue is going to be what's happening now and how do we get the users that are presently doing this to move forward with it because it's, it's the uh, helicopter community or the airplane community uh, is, going to, is regulated with certain uh, technology, ADSB, for example, yeah. and uh, there is no, um, no way of identifying a UAS that is not being a drone that's being operated outside of the regulatory environment that uh, to avoid. And I know there's software, things like that, but the community, I think is so, um, uh, they don't know enough about it to even start with. This to them is still that personal toy. Mm -hmm. And that, that personal toy now can go up to 50 pounds or whatever it, it can be, but it's, um, it, it's because it can be lethal much smaller to an aircraft that's airborne. Right. So making like that, something like this, for example, in a rotor would would be a bad day. Or come through a window and hit yeah. somebody. But the idea is that uh, 
having the community involvement and, and doing that in a larger scale. We have several organizations I know in Oahu that are focused at UAS. They have memberships, they have get-togethers, and uh, that spreading that out. Uh, the Helicopter Association International is very serious about integration of this because they, they see the future of that also. So uh, in their involvement locally would help. AOPAs, things like that, as we discussed earlier, are uh, all venues of, of education. Uh, the FAA, I don't think, is tasked uh, in their staff to enforce anything. They really don't have enough time, have enough trouble with existing regulation, let alone what's coming down the road. Um, so I agree that uh, community yeah. outreach is definitely where we need to go. Let's, uh, let's take a, our one minute break here that we're allowed by the show and come back after that break and talk about exactly how we should do that, maybe even within the next six months. Okay. I'm Jay Fidel, ThinkTech. ThinkTech loves energy. I'm the host of Mina, Marco, and Me, which is Mina Morita, former chair of the PUC, former legislator, and uh, Energy Dynamics, a consulting organization in energy. Marco Mangelsdorf is the CEO of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Every two weeks, we talk about energy, everything about energy. Come around and watch us. We're on at noon on Mondays, every two weeks on ThinkTech. Aloha. Hello, I'm Yukari Kunisue. I'm your host of the new Japanese language show on Think Tech Hawaii, called Konnichiwa Hawaii, broadcasting live every other Monday at 2 p.m. Please join us, where we discuss important and useful information for the Japanese language community in Hawaii. The show will be all in Japanese. Hope you can join us every other Monday at 2 p.m. Aloha. We are back, show, uh, back, folks, with our show, Where the Drone Leads. Ted Ralston here with the guest George Purdy on Lanai and uh, Eric Lincoln here. Eric, thanks for coming on the show again, Thank first you. timer, and Scott Allen of FISDO. And I did get that straight. That is FAA, not Future Farmers, right? It could be both, but Perfect. today it's FAA, okay? And we're just talking before the break about the need for getting information out, getting people to understand it, because it's foreign to a lot of folks in this world of uh, drone usage. and. You know, this legislation session begins in uh, basically December of this year. The timing is right to start planning some kind of a November gathering of some kind where the various users of the airspace gather and invite the legislators in as well and our public safety people following the lines of the FAA Community Involvement Manual, which I don't know if, if any, how many people inside the FAA know that even exists. That thing is actually a very rich document in terms of uh, what goes on. Anything that changes in the use of the air, adding a runway to an airport, uh, going from uh, uh, ILS to SAT base, to anything like that, really is required to be led into the community by that means. So, perfect. We'll follow that example. Let's do that. Let's set up something that we can work with you and the Aviation Caucus on pulling the, the manned users together. We can certainly work on as many of the unmanned as we can find and invite the legislators uh, who are involved in this. There's half a dozen who pay attention to this a lot. That, would, that we could do. And uh, that's just an that's just, yeah, idea here, but um, uh, we'd have to think of a location that's convenient for people where parking is easy, not like here where you have to find a narrow little slot to pull into. <laughs> but, it worked. Uh, yeah. And the capital is a little tough parking-wise, but maybe out at the airport would be the right way to do it. And. Uh, uh, is that something that makes sense? Let me ask Scott, what, what, is that something we could, we could pull together? Uh, absolutely, and as, as George was talking, and George, maybe we can get together offline. Um, there, there are some notes in my talking points about the uh, UAS integration pilot program, and uh, that was uh, initiated uh, in October uh, 2017, where the president directed the Secretary of uh, Transportation uh, to come up with a pilot program intended to advance integration without stifling in innovation. And I'd like to read one of the bullets, and I'm, I, I don't normally like it when just reading stuff, but it was so on point with what you and George were talking about, and I think we can pursue this, but um, the UAS integration pilot program creates a mechanism for the private sector and state, local, tribal governments to make experience-based and data-driven uh, contributions to the national framework to safely integrate drones into our economy. And, and you were talking about expanding from the 3,200 people population on Lanai, 
and expanding it into Honolulu and, and expanding it into the national airspace. And uh, I haven't been working with this, but, but it does exist. George, uh, Ted, would like to invite um, um, more uh, uh, research into this and it might be a mechanism for us to move forward. You know, we can capitalize on that because we did make an application as Hawaii for that under DBED. Uh, we didn't get selected on the first round, but we were part of the Alaska submission and did get selected as part of that. So we're a little bit in there. But I got a call from a gentleman in DC who was taking all those who didn't get selected to say, can we still help you? That is, don't, don't think because you didn't get selected. Uh, we're not here to help. If you've got some ideas, let's go. So I can recontact that gentleman and maybe we can get DC to come out here and be part of this this thing we put together, this Calabash. Whatever I can do to help, I, I very okay. much want to be on board with that. And and I didn't realize, but again, um, when it comes to uh, SUAS, when um, there's something that I know about the, the programs that you don't know about, it would be a very shocking day. But uh, I'm not surprised. <laughs> no, you're already engaged. Well, we can we can go do that now. You can get you, get your side to uh, come into this, get the educators into this. We have the uh, HHA, the Hawaii Helicopter Association, mm -hmm. which should also participate. Is uh, it's mainly the tour helicopters, but it does. We're trying to get as many of the utility operators, police, and fire involved also, so that uh, understanding each other's point of views really where we need to go. Uh, the aircraft in flight, of course, pilot in command. He's he's got a lot to deal with already, so uh, it's going to be a, a task, a, a large task. So. Uh, we'll participate. So I'm just wondering how we communicate these complicated issues to our to the public, who is the guy who bought that drone and takes it out of a box and doesn't necessarily see things, doesn't know about Class E airspace, doesn't know about uh, about uh, one, two, three, four, five, or some other means of communication, doesn't know about looking at uh, what 129, 98, whatever the tour helicopters are. And 136. And uh, uh, so there's a lot of things that go on mm -hmm. all the time that you guys have found a way to make effective and, and you do it without thinking about it much because it's what you have to do but it goes so fast and it's in such a cryptic language that it's hard for the folks on the outside to pick that up I suspect so uh, some form of explanation of what you actually go through on a daily basis going across Waimanalo Bay for example uh, down low uh, you got to check with Kaneohe to get into the Delta airspace there and then uh, but if they're closed what do you do uh, so this well, that's all going on. Uh, the drone guy down there is hauling his fishing line out or something, and you know, they they are in the same space. He doesn't know what's going on. He doesn't know how busy your guy is uh, trying to work through the circumstances. So we have to illustrate somehow. Just maybe start by basically illustrating what we're all doing. Yeah, the it's a very good point she's brought up. You know, the the 400 foot ceiling is misleading to start with. You know, a lot of the operations don't need to go to 400. And the helicopter operations were already restricted to do air tours a certain, but other than the air tour, you know, it's a safe operation, and that leaves it up to the pilot to operate. So the, the education on both sides as to what's necessary versus what's legal or is, is really where the common sense is going to have to come in. But as we know that doesn't, in aviation isn't always applicable. But uh, we've got some, uh, some good leadership, I think, in the um, communities to uh, to tap and I think George has really given a good example of how he's taken it to his community and taking a bull by the horns and actually stepped up and, and making it a part of their uh, tools kit that they can use uh, how we do that to 1.4 million people <laughs> <laughs> right uh, that's a that's a good question but I think uh, we have a lot of retailers we need to talk to uh, some of the clubs that we're talking to uh, there's uh, in today's generation the internet uh, people are on board a bit before you actually they even was a suggestion at one time before you could even buy one you had to have a license that you actually go on and register and do this but it met a lot of resistance I think we have to overcome that resistance I think we have to actually uh, make people who purchase these uh, responsible and on top of all this the current status there's always the things that are emerging like there's going to be an electronic signature required to be broadcast by these guys uh, as soon as the, uh, I think it's the DCA gets its, it gets the specifications written, that's now part of the FAA, it transferred from RTCA to the FAA recently, so that's going to happen. Uh, ADSB out is going to be in all the uh, small aircraft up in, uh, what, uh, April of 2020 or something like that is the execution day. January 1, 2020. Yeah, and a lot of these guys are carrying dual ADSB outs already, so there's good, now, as soon as that happens, if all of the drones 
began broadcasting on ADS-B, the, the system would be flooded, I have a feeling. And it, we'll see. But yes. I don't know if anybody tested the thing for that level of uh, operation, or exactly what do you do? You get a warning, aircraft nearby. Okay, uh, <laughs> now what's next? Well, so, from the pilot perspective, is he gonna see that yeah. at what distance? Yeah, exactly. They're going to see and yeah. avoid is not really a realistic thing at that small. Uh, right. Uh, the user on the ground seeing ADS uh, aircraft nearby has one perspective. The guy mm -hmm. in the cockpit at 99.8 percent and two has a different set of things. He's on a radio. He's talking to the tourists and he's looking down and got to take care of this now too. So there's two different circumstances and two different perspectives that are merging in in some way. And the, well, impa and the impacts we have to illustrate are, that to each other. Yes, but the impacts are uh, really what concern us in the industry. I mean, it's, it's one thing to lose your drone. It's another to lose yeah. six, seven lives. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And uh, I think that's the, been the, uh, a gap in uh, some of the users, the amateur users. Uh, professionals, I think, are doing a great job. But the uh, amateur users, a lot of them don't understand that that piece of, of a toy can bring down an aircraft full of people. And, and again, if, if I could jump in, the communication and, and part of our outreach, as you mentioned, the, the schools, if we could start with the schools and get the younger people involved and maybe they can help carry the message to their, their parents. But as we say, toy, it's not a toy, it's an aircraft. Anything that flies in the airspace uh, is, is an aircraft under the purview of the FAA. So it's our job to promote and ensure the safety of the flying public and, and everybody and drone operators. It, it is definitionally not a toy. So excuse me for jumping in, but, no, you're right. but you're it's right. it's anytime anytime you lift off the ground, it's serious. Well, we're, we're this show goes very goes by very quickly. This is the first of many interactions. I hope we can have like this. Just a quick one, uh, Rob. Do we have any call call ins uh, questions coming in from the audience? Okay. Well, then we'll, uh, we'll drive forward here. So I think we're sort of mutually committing ourselves to something that pulls us all together. We'll talk, take George's guidance and leadership in, in helping us make that happen. And I will just illustrate one story. Uh, I was talking to Jay Skaggs in the, uh, Washington, in the uh, Anchorage. Uh, Fairbanks uh, Visdo, oh, and he said, make sorry. sure George comes to our conference next week. So everybody needs to know that George is a nationally respected voice in this game, and uh, we appreciate that very much. George, we're, uh, we're, what do you think of this idea of having a gathering before the legislative session begins? Because that's an important part too. And I should put a shout out to Roger Wong at HPD, who's working on that on the HPD side of it. You mentioned uh, public safety and uh, Howard Naoni over at HFD, who's working on his side of it. And they're all part of this whole equation. George, uh, some comments from you on uh, putting together a island level uh, interaction. Oh, that is a must. That is actually the driving force that will change our future and how UAS integrates into the airspace. We should never stop having these conversations. You know, I mean, for example, when you came to Lanai and we did that UAS public meeting, you saw how a community, a well-educated community, came in there with viable questions and no disheartening. They knew exactly what we were talking about. And you can give some aspects on just meeting this community and the meeting and uh, and how we explain what we want to do on the night. And I follow the FAA's community involvement manual to the T and that's the outcome that you got. So you can speak to that experience. It works. Okay, so we have George's leadership and guidance and permission to go ahead and copy what George has done on Lanai over here on Oahu and we'll invite you to it, George, of course. And yep. then, so we're talking about something before the, we're talking November, December. We'll all do it together. We'll get on this show and tell how it's going in six weeks. How would that be? Sounds fine. Okay. Brazil to follow. Brazil. <laughs> That'll be our coordination center. In okay. joke. All right. <laughs> Possible to get the state DOT also. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And, they and it's from. Department of Education. I mean, it, it, that's the point. It, like we said at the beginning, it doesn't end, right? It just keeps rolling. Right. And we'll have to imagine ourselves doing this every year to keep up with the technology changes and uh, issues, uh, best practices that are occurring elsewhere. So at this point in time, let me say we're going to have to close the show off. Let me just thank George Purdy for sitting in from Lanai. And uh, you can go back to work now, George. And Eric Lincoln, yep. well, same for you, back to work. <laughs> and Scott, back to work. Always okay. a pleasure. And uh, thanks for coming yeah. on the show. And we'll go work together on this problem for a long time. You're on. Thanks, thanks very much. Good job, See George. See you all next week, folks.